in these fermenters. With the reds, the skins rise to the top, form the cap. And then after the fermentation is over, sometime 10 to 21 days, uh, the cap is, uh, the skins are put into the press and that's where we get the pressed wine. And then the wine and the fermenters. After the rest, the skins to the top, form the cap. And then after the fermentation is put into barrels like this, time where it completes now left to 21 days uh, and uh, goes through its aging and clarification process. Um, and then a mobile bottling line is brought in to put the wine into bottle. And that's the process. Okay, this is a Hi everyone. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. We're going to give a few minutes for people to join us. Uh, but to everyone who's already here. Hello, welcome to this uh, online wine tasting webinar with Frenchly and La Cave. Today we have two wine experts, Daniel and Frederick from La Cave here in Napa Valley, California. Uh, today they will conduct a comparative wine tasting of two Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, from Complet Wine in California and Lucien Rocco in Burgundy, France. Um, Daniel and Frederick, I'm going to let you take over, but before that, maybe we can hear from the people who bought the wines today. Um, we know that Heidi, Olga, and Dan um, bought the wines today. Maybe you want to connect, say hi, maybe say where you're connecting from today. And everyone else who is here on the webinar, we would love to hear from you as well. Uh, go ahead. I'm going to allow everyone to talk, and if you can just say your name and maybe where you're connecting from, that would be great. <laughs> well, we are very happy. My name is Frederick with La Cave and I'm very honored to have uh, to be by Daniel Seint, Daniel Baron, uh, that you might have seen has uh, quite an extensive experience with making some of the best wines in the world. Uh, if not the best wines in the world. Thank you, Frederick. <laughs> and uh, now has his own venture with his son, uh, Sam, and wife, Gwyneth, for, with Complan Wine. So making really unique wines uh, here in Napa Valley. And we'll obviously hear all about that today and taste through a couple of them. Um, there was just a fun other video while we were just waiting for another couple uh, people to join that I just wanted to share with you. So I'll go ahead and do that right now. It's really how to pull wine from uh, a red barrel. And so we put that together with, uh, with Daniel. So uh, just check it out. It's rather unusual. And it's an unusual way to pull wine from a red barrel. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how I learned to sample barrels uh, in Pomerol and Saint-Emilion where, where I worked for a year and a half for two vintages. And this is a way to pull a sample without uh, getting any air into the barrel. And there, no, that's the Chardonnay, isn't it? We treat the barrels uh, we do the élevage of the wine as I learned to do it in Pomerol and Saint-Emilion, uh, so that we are actually racking the barrels, which means we're pulling the clear wine out from the bottom of the barrel, which is called the souterrage traditionnel. So, sou from underneath, tirage, pull. So, we're pulling the clear wine from underneath and leaving the, the sediment behind down in the bilge of the barrel. Um, and what that means is that we don't, we don't touch the barrels for three months, and that means that they are actually pulling a vacuum. And so to sample, the traditional way to sample is to use these very esoteric tools from France. This is called a marteau tenaille, which means hammer pliers, marteau tenaille, uh, and us, this is a traditional Sellerman's tool, also the Cooper's tool. And I always have a spare fosse 
This is like, looks like a golf tee, but it's made from oak. In case this one breaks off, I always have a spare one handy. I'll place it right here. And a wine glass and a sponge. So this is a quarter inch hole drilled in the barrel. Uh, even the dogs are interested in this technique. And we're gonna start by hammering the ox into the box. And we're going to loosen our cloche. I can tell was put in a little overzealously, so I will be ready to use the spare one. And one of the most remarkable things is to, and if you listen closely, you'll hear the air being pulled into the barrel. And I have now a quarter inch hold of the barrel and no wine coming out, which is quite stunning. And what we're gonna now do is pump the wine Barrel. We're going to take our brand new rosé, put it back in, and with the mouth of tonight, lightly tap just until we feel it seep. If we tap it too hard, then we'll never get it out. And here we have a sample of the 2020. Complain Cabernet Sauvignon without having really compromised the vacuum in the barrel. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video. And sorry, I kind of came into the shot there. Uh, but we thought it was rather unusual, uh, unusual way of putting wine out of the barrel and certainly something that a lot of people used to do, but I'm not too sure that many people still do right now. No. Um, just a handful. And I don't guess. think yeah. very many people in California <laughs> do it this way. <laughs> right. So um, for those of you who have the wine, and even if you don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, couple of wines. So we uh, each have our Complant Chardonnay, and then the uh, Lucien Rocco Chardonnay from Burgundy, so California, and then uh, Burgundy in France. Um, we're going to taste the two side by side. We already pre pulled all the red wines uh, down below. So it will allow, uh, to, those will probably taste at about 1.30 and about 20 minutes from now, just to allow them to open up. Um, and, um, and yeah, with, without, if you have any questions throughout the, uh, throughout the tasting, feel free to write those in the comments. Um, and uh, Jeanne will kind of uh, let us know that, uh, you know, there are some questions to address. Uh, but uh, yeah. Well, and, and I think the whole point of this tasting is the question that comes to everyone's mind. You know, we see the same varieties being grown in France and uh, California and Oregon and Washington, and we see them all over the world, uh, particularly the international varieties like Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. And what is the difference? How much uh, can one replicate the characteristics of these well-known wines from the old world in right. new world vineyards? And the answer is you can't. Uh, you can't make Burgundy in Beaujolais. Why could you make it in California, Oregon? But as, as if we were musicians being inspired by the classics, I think we look to the classic wines of the old world as inspiration. Uh, we look to some of the techniques and decide whether they work in our uh, situation or not. And one of the primary differences, is, particularly when we talk about Burgundy, is that the grapes in Burgundy are typically grown on calcareous soils, which means they are soils with high pH. You all remember your high school chemistry uh, or your, your PhD in analytic chemistry, for those of you out there with more sophisticated backgrounds, <laughs> but pH uh, seven is neutral. And something under seven is considered acidic and something over seven is considered basic. The soils in Burgundy are basic soils. They're, they're more 
or I should say less acidic than uh, seven or more basic. And it was one of the great crises of phylloxera was finding uh, American rootstocks that would grow in these great French vineyard areas, not just Burgundy, but Champagne, uh, Saint-Emilion, um, et cetera. And it's often said in the world of grape growing that basic soils give acidic wines. So the more limestone there is in a soil, the more acidic the wines will be. And that has to do with how the pH affects the availability of nutrients in the soil, particularly potassium. Now we're getting right. too, too detailed, yes. but the wines will always be different. And, and that's the important thing. Soil, right. climate, um, the fact that the French soils have been farmed for so many generations, particularly in Burgundy back yeah. I mean, Lucien Rocco, that, you know, we're having his Chardonnay today. He's the 18th generation uh, winemaker for his family, the Rocco family. Uh, and, you know, just to date that, it's the first recorded vintage was 1270. Um, so, you know, the monks hadn't really started doing any wines at that time, uh, barely any. Um, you know, it does go back quite a while uh, ago. And obviously, uh, having been part of some of those families, they have kind of that knowledge that's, that comes from, you know, decades of harvests and centuries of harvests and uh, bringing that knowledge to, uh, to wine that we're able to enjoy. And I know it's a big question of the climate change and what, what that will become, uh, but I think that, you know, it's, it has been a certain way for the past seven or eight hundred years. It's definitely changing and uh, we just need to with, uh, with kind of the the climate and the cards were dealt. So I think everybody's kind of got their, got their mind to that uh, right now. And the, the depletion of, of nutrients in soils that have vines on them for so many centuries is, you can't replicate that. So the earliest vineyards in California were planted in the 1800s. And I remember I had an expert when I was uh, the general manager at Dominus come from France to, he was flown in to lecture at a technical lecture on nitrogen additions. And he said, Danielle, I've looked at your soils and I've studied and what I've uh, come to the conclusion that no one ever needs to add nitrogen in American soils. So uh, what do I tell them at this conference? How much nitrogen <laughs> should we add? None, thank you very much. Thanks for the flight. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, let's, shall we yeah. taste and, let's and, taste, and yeah. talk about this? Yeah. So, so starting with the Burgundy one. So the Burgundy Chardonnay that we're tasting right now is the 2016 uh, Bourgogne from Haute Côte de Bonne. So Lucien Rocco is uh, based in, uh, based in Saint-Romain. So uh, just east of, uh, just west of uh, Meursault. And, uh, and we'll see that in a, in a little bit with him explaining where, where the vineyard is for, for the wine. And um, it's, uh, it's delicious. It's, it's uh, quite uh, lovely. <laughs> what do you think? It's 2016. So in comparison to the 2019 Chardonnay, it, does, it has had time to you know, age a little bit. So, um, but well, we forget um, when we talk about aging, most people think about tannin. And because we think about aging red wines, but acidity is very important in aging. And yeah. this wine was probably very tart when it was young, yeah. but with what is now five years of age, it's beautiful and it's taken on some secondary characters as the acid has softened and integrated into the wine. And it has a wonderful core of ripe apple um, on, the, on the nose, which is a very yeah. typical descriptor for Chardonnay. It's very varietal. The, the, there is, it, I'm, a, I'm assuming he's fermenting in barrel, yep. but not much new oak. It's, it's a subtle hint so, of oak that yep. frames the wine beautifully. Yeah, and what he actually does uh, with this one, he used quite a bit of, uh, of used oak. And then he has, um, obviously, the Saint-Aubin Premier Cru, if we, you know, in, the, in his higher end wines. Uh, and with those, what he'll use quite a bit is uh, oak barrels, but without any toast. And I'm not meaning breakfast toast. <laughs> I'm meaning whenever you uh, 
you know, create the barrel, you have to burn the, the wood typically to bend it. And so you can burn it more or less and that creates toast and uh, that is then transferred to the wine. And so for his, for those barrels, for those nicer ones, he uses uh, water. And so it's, it's hot water. They're water bent. They're exactly. Also, yeah. Water bent. And so there's minimal intervention into the wine. And that's really what Lucien uh, and Fanny are about, is just being minimal, uh, you know, in, intervene at the minimum part and just let nature kind of express itself through the through the hands. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great expression of, of Burgundy. Chandler. One of the great uh, descriptors that people talk about, particularly with French white wines, is minerality. And I think there's a lot of confusion. People say, oh, I can taste the limestone. No, you can't taste the limestone. It's not that simple. It's coming up through the roots and you're not going to get limestone character coming into the grapes. But acidity, like this wine has natural acidity, is often, uh, often associated with that wet slate uh, mineral uh, sensation. It's almost a sensation more than a taste. And, and this wine definitely has it. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who didn't have the foresight to order the wines, it's not too late. We will give you an opportunity. So, you know, take a few notes and see if, if we're just making it up or if it's really in the wine. That's your challenge, you know, because <laughs> uh, for other than the three people who ordered wine, we could be saying anything, right? You know, it tastes yeah. like raspberries, don't you think, Fred? <laughs> Uh, no, it is it is delicious it's uh, it's, beautiful it's a very special wine and, and uh, what's the price on this so the price for this one is uh 38 dollars okay. uh, before any discount or anything like that and we'll get into it and give you the promo code to all of the wine but uh for daniel and i we're actually uh extending uh 25 discount on all of our wines uh up until um monday uh for uh for just the group and those that will be watching this. So we'll give you the promo code in just a little bit, but you can order on either of our sites. So Daniel's Wine on complanwines.com websites and or, uh, Lucien, uh, Lucien's Wine, Lucien Rocco's Wine on uh, La Cave's website. Complan Wine. Complan Wine. Yes. Yeah. And we'll Thank have you. little QR codes later on. So yeah. you can, you can, you'll be able to snap. So snap doing, put, put me down for a case. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Daniel. <laughs> All right. Well, then I just wanted to share a video uh, Daniel and I made where we see uh, some, and before we go to the, actually, do we have any questions, Jan? Anything you'd like to address? We don't have questions yet, but to everyone who's present right now, I know we have Fran, Gloria, Heidi, Matt, Vida, you're all here in the room with us. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask the question anytime. We'd love to hear from you. And Jean, you are also welcome to ask us questions. So thank you. If there's something you haven't been clear, clear about. Uh, I'm listening very closely. It's so interesting. Please let us know. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, let's go to the video right now. Um, all right, this guy right there. All right. Ah, sampling the Chardonnay. Okay. All right. Burgundy. Uh, this is. So we have different barrels for Burgundy wines and different barrels for Bordeaux wines. The Burgundy barrels have thicker staves because they are constructed, keeping in mind Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which are more delicate varieties, and we want a little less air exchange. So we have a thicker staved barrel. And these Chardonnay, this is the 2021 Linda Vista Chardonnay. We'll be tasting the 2019. Uh, but this is fermented in barrel on what we call native yeast, indigenous yeah. yeast. Perfect. And um, we're going to fill a sample. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe if you shine this light, uh, oh, people see. might be able to see. If you don't shine it at the camera, but at the barrel. <laughs> yeah. And if you light up right here. Uh, this is a fermentation bung. So this is a two-part bung that allows uh, carbon dioxide to burp right. out so the barrel heads don't explode. Right. And this is because this wine is going through the secondary fermentation. Yes. So if you put your ear to this barrel, tell me what you hear. It's getting 
up in milk and you you get get crackling, crackling and crackling like a little yeah. popcorn maybe. Exactly, yeah, yeah. just yeah. Uh, so. coming out and activity. So <laughs> one of the things that many, even many professional winemakers don't know is the proper way to use a wine thief. And I was taught this by Jean-Paul Berouet, the winemaker at Chateau Picus. Okay. So when you use a wine thief, you always keep your thumb on the end of the teeth. And that way you avoid any impurities or film yeast on the surface. So now that the thief is inserted into the middle of the barrel, then you release your thumb. Okay. And now you let the, give the time for the wine to fill. And the next step is you always want to rinse your glass. So I'm going to rinse my glass. Look at that, I can score left-handed. But that's pretty good. Yes, very impressive. And Frederic is going to score his glass. And we're not going to taste yet. I'm going to go back in for the second time. And that rinses the glasses and the thief of any water or, or uh, God forbid, soap. Right. And then you're going uh, to pour your glass you to... back in. Yeah. Oh, okay. We we never waste wine. <laughs> if we're in Burgundy, we actually spit back into the barrel. But we, we, we won't. We won't. You know how the French are. Yes. Oh, no, you are French. I am anyhow French. Oh, okay. Anyhow. Then I can I can insult the French, and you won't mind. And now we're tasting this. Uh, this is a wine that has no sugar left. Right. The primary fermentation is done. And it's about 20% through the secondary fermentation. All of this natural uh, or non-inoculated yeast and non -elastic. Perfect. And so just so everybody knows, so that first fermentation, like you said, transforms the, the sugar into alcohol, uh, along with obviously different flavors. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not that great. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the secondary fermentation, transforms the bright acid you might find in green apples, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc have it, into lactic acid. Uh, that you find the in acid milk. of milk or cheese. Exactly, yes. so that's what brings the mouth feel, the mouth texture, and uh, kind of the creaminess of, of the wines. Exactly, so and most of us think that fermentation is the transformation of sugar to alcohol, yeah. but in fact, if we look it up in the La Rousse, <laughs> fermentation is any process that generates carbon dioxide. So the fermentation of pickles or sauerkraut or uh, making yogurt or sourdough yeast, which are lactobacillus fermentations, are actually transformation of, of acid. I'm not sure about the milk. There's some sauerkraut, sourdough, uh, starter, and uh, pickles right. are, are um, transformations, as you said, of malic acid to lactic acid. Right. Yeah, interesting. This is tasting delicious. Isn't it beautiful? A little kind of like apple flavor. Yes, and, and even a little citrus, which, because yeah. we pick at very low bricks, yeah. and uh, we're probably making a 12% alcohol Chardonnay. Perfect. Okay. So. And you mentioned um, indigenous yeast earlier. And yes. So that just so everybody knows, it's indigenous yeast is the yeast that is found is from the grape skins that is outside or from the leaves from the vineyard and yes. from the winery and That's from the winery forget. yes so from the winery the hoses <laughs> the floor the walls right. it's everywhere <clears throat> the, the beauty of it is that it's not just one yeast that does the fermentation but a series of yeasts right and that gives us more complexity in the world yeah yeah. The different yeast transform the sugars and wines different ways. Slightly different ways, slightly different aromatic byproducts of the fermentation. Well, cheers, cheers to you and thanks for having me in your wonderful barrel room. Thank you. <laughs> Frederick. All right. <clears throat> well, we called it Winemaking 101, so that that's... Uh, sorry about the audio. We were doing the best, the best we could in, in a working barrel. And uh, we forgot to bring a cinematographer, so we had the, had the camera propped up on the barrel. <laughs> the audio was great. We do yeah. have a question from Emily on Facebook. She's asking, how long do, do the Chardonnay stay in the barrels? Uh, in our case, about six months. 
Yeah. And one of the one of the choices in um, during the the fermentation is whether the leaves are stirred or not. Um, and the, the leaves? I'm sorry, the leaves are. And any time a wine is stored, uh, it it drops sediment, and we call that well when it's in when the wine is being made, we call it lees. When the wine is in the bottle, we call it sediment. And I had a foreman who once said that he really liked drinking older wines because the sentiment fell to the bottom of the bottle. And I thought that was a, a wonderful <laughs> spoonerism. Um, so six months and then the decision is, is how, how long, whether the lees get stirred, which creates a little bit of, of uh, oxidation, which gives some nutty complexity to the wine and was all the rage in the 80s in California when people uh, started barrel fermenting, went from fermenting in tanks. Mm -hmm. And um, in the 80s, I was making wine and we had a visit from uh, winemakers from, uh, from France, from, from Burgundy. And everyone was saying, well, you know, we went to France and we asked them, you know, with our high school French, uh, Monsieur, vous faites le remouage combien de fois? And the, and the winemaker would say, un fois par semaine, you know, as he smoked his yellow Galois cigarette. Well, I asked these winemakers and I said, est-ce que vous faites le, le remouage un fois par semaine? Do you stir the lees uh, once a week? And they said, yes. And I said, well, but all through the life of the six months in barrel. And he laughed at me, said, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. Just during the malolactic fermentation. And to tell you the truth, towards the end of the fermentation, we walk by the barrel with the stick and hit the side of the barrel. And that's the remouage. <laughs> so in California, people were taking drills and paint stirrers and, yeah. and then Chains they couldn't figure out why the, why the wines would fall apart in the bottle yeah so uh we've gotten a little more educated in california yeah so, so we should but, taste this. yeah let's taste so this one's the 2019 chardonnay from the linda vista vin we'll actually go and see that vineyard um towards in about 15 minutes we have uh, we're going to see burgundy before we see napa uh and um but yeah it's it's a delicious wine and you know, you, tasting brother. it now after we tasted it from the from the barrel, mm -hmm. it is. I mean, it's obviously a different vintage, but it's a, diff, a very different wine. Um, you know, pre malolactic. Yes. Um, and just like all the, I remember just the kind of red apple flavors that you get, right. and like really in French, I would, would say gourmand. I'm not too sure what the word is in English, uh, but just you know, yummy might be yes. the best, yeah, the best, yeah, the best yeah, word yeah, for yeah. it. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it's really incredible how much. And, and you know, you, you've kind of taken the wind out of my sails because I was going to talk about how unusual it is for us to be releasing the 2019, you know, to have given this wine an extra year of bottle age, but then you present a 2016 white burgundy. Yeah. So, but it's similar in the sense that these, these are wines uh, the Complan Chardonnay is between 11 and a half and 12 and a half percent alcohol. Very unusual. Uh, in used, new, fairly neutral Burgundy barrels, you saw the Burgundy barrels in the video. Um, they're thicker staved so that it, it holds in the delicacy of the Chardonnay is a very delicate variety. The varietal character is very subtle and can easily be overwhelmed by too much processing. Right. And you know, that's, it, they're beverages, right? So if what you like is a big oaky buttery Chardonnay, there's plenty out there from California at 14% alcohol, but there's very few that you can find that are at 12% alcohol that are based on acidity and freshness and true varietal expression. And I think that's what, and, you know, and that's the link between these right. two wines as much as they're different. There is a link of the varietal character, the acidity, and the fact that they are age-worthy whites. And, and I mean, exactly. And also just something, and, you know, on the barrel aging question, you know, the, the Burgundy ones age about seven months as well. And it is also 100% native yeasts. And uh, they actually have never used 
any other yeast uh, in and around the winery. And so you really get that buildup of yeast. And like Daniel was saying, it's like the, you know, the, the yeast that transformed the, the sugar into alcohol uh, comes from the wine and everywhere in the winery, it's in the, the walls, you know, it's just transforming and uh, transforming the wine basically. And that's really a unique character. Uh, I always remember just have, uh, having tasted a wine, um, you know, several bottles of it and never met the winemaker and, or visited. And so I visited the, the cellar once and it was funny and it was just, you get into the cellar and you just, get the yeah. woof of uh of of you know kind of the uh like it just hits you and it's almost like you know the the different the different yeast and everything that it's just it's everywhere and it's uh it's it's very uh it's very humbling to think that every house has their own uh their own kind of yeast microflora uh, sort of, exactly yeah. mi microflora um and um but yeah so very comparable to wines really um you know and just on terroir because uh we touched on it earlier but i think it's important to know that you know if napa valley was to be in uh europe it would be closer to southern spain or morocco and so the amount of sun exposure that you get in california is much higher than the one that you get in france and let alone burgundy that's obviously um, you know, middle to north, and um, and so that plays. You know, sun exposition plays a huge role on on what you know what the wine is going to end up being, and so uh, three days, right? So yeah, or insolation, not insulation. insulation, but insolation. The amount, the number of hours of sunlight, and remember, California is a true Mediterranean climate, which means as as. Frédéric said it's much more akin to uh, Nice or, or uh, Avignon than it is to, to Burgundy or Bordeaux. They are not Mediterranean climates, which means it's cloudy, it rains in the summer, um, and it, it can be challenging in, um, in those regions because of the moisture and humidity during the growing season can bring on uh, rot and mildew and various uh, fungi, but it also uh, just creates a completely different environment. Right. The other thing I think we should clarify because you know we we are so close, we sometimes forget that we uh, talk in we assume everyone knows what we're talking about. Yeast. Most most commercial winemakers in in the United States use commercial yeast. And that's not doesn't mean they're buying um, Red Star baking yeast. If you think about it, there's nothing easier than breeding yeast. You get many, many generations in a year. And so you can um, go to places like, uh, like I have a friend who bought used barrels from Chateau Latour in France, and he scraped the barrels and then he plated out the yeast and he had the Chateau Latour yeast and he had the Chateau Latour malolactic. Um, there's a, a yeast that come that came from, it's called BM43, that was isolated from Brunello del Montalcino. And no matter what you ferment with it, it tastes like Brunello del Montalcino. Uh, <laughs> there are also very neutral yeasts like Prise de Mousse and Pasteur Champagne, which um, really don't do much to transform right. uh, what's coming in from the vineyard. And so the commercial winemaker has this whole range of, of flavors and um, textures that, that he or she can choose. Indigenous fermentations, as I said in the video, um, you have a, a progression of different yeasts that are going to ferment. Uh, the wine, and some of them come in on the grapes, most of them are in the in the winery, and eventually Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what does right. the majority of the fermentation. So it's in the early phases that you end up getting a little more complexity. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I think yeah. that was a great explanation, but if, uh, if any of you have questions, Jeanne? We don't have questions from the audience yet, but I have a personal question. Yeah, please. What kind of food would you pair with a Chardonnay? It's a great question. I just, because it just brings back memories and uh, I just love it so much, but just smoked salmon, 
um, is really the one that that always kind of comes to mind with me. Uh, so, well, salmon rillettes. Just I used to go, um, you know, fishing with my grandfather and um, up in up in Scotland, and that's just something that's just one of my fondest memories. And so, and that's really my number one um, pairing that I love with Chardonnay. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've recently become really excited about uh, about uh, sea bass and the black sea bass, which tends to expand when you cook it. So uh, taking a sea bass or rock cod, which is uh, popular or, or we fish ourselves for ling cod um, and poaching it with a little bit of of the white wine um, and some uh slices of lemon uh, also it's a good time for wild mushrooms right. so uh some some yeah. chanterelles or giroir. i think one of the best recipes but abalone is now restricted you take a uh, abalone um you pound it a little bit you surround it with uh chanterelles you pour white white wine the complan chart either of these wines halfway up the abalone <laughs> I put it in a 350 degree oven for an hour <laughs> and serve that with uh, some scalloped potatoes. And uh, there you go. Yeah. Wow. Is that what we're having tonight? <laughs> yes. Come on over. <laughs> that uh, sounds amazing. I wonderful. think we have a question from Heidi. Heidi, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Sure. I was curious if all the rain that California just got, which is kind of unusual, will affect anything in the growing season in California? Well, the grapes are all harvested. Uh, well, it, it affected a few people who were waiting to get um, very high sugars to make those 16% uh, alcohol trophy wines. Uh, but most of us had our fruit in. Um, it it created some flooding. It was such, so much rain in such a short period. Uh, but mostly it's, it, it, you know what it really affected? It ended the fire season. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been living now since 2017 with this, this fear of wildfires um, that, you know, also affect the, if the vineyards near them uh, with smoke taint. So that was one thing, and it really gave us a sense that we might be able to come out of the out of the drought. It filled a few reservoirs, um, but we need you know we need another twenty inches. Let's see, we we got about eight to fifteen inches of rain in three days. Uh, typically, we need twenty inches of rain to get through a growing season, and probably 30 inches of rain around the Napa area is considered normal. Uh, so it helped, but it, it didn't, um, didn't get us quite uh, out of the drought. Yeah. But the, Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And else, I think just something that just to be, everybody was aware is the drought, what that does to us is most of the Valley. I know uh, people I know, you know, you only get, you get less grapes every year. And so for us, uh, you know, people I know, you just have uh, about 40% yield of what you would normally be 100% yield, 40% uh, of a normal yield, should I say. And uh, so with having enough rain and filling up all those reservoirs and hopefully we get more, uh, that will just mean that next year should be, you know, a more uh, normal year if there is such thing these days. So uh, we're looking forward to, to more rain. So yeah, maybe hopefully yeah. not all at once though. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing this since the early 70s, and I went through the 76 and 77 droughts, which were very bad at the time, but I've never seen it as bad as this year. Uh, we got some of the northern vineyards uh, that had riparian rights going back to 1910, were told they couldn't pump out of the Russian River, and they had young vineyards that probably really suffered. Uh, the was uh, very concentrated. Actually, the wines are quite wonderful, but we can't take uh, two years like this in a row. Yeah. So we really need some water. All right. Well, I think it's time to start with the reds. So I'll let everybody reach and maybe open up the reds if you haven't already and maybe taste, uh, take a few sips while listening to Lucien, uh, listening to some French. So mm -hmm. be prepared. There are some subtitles. So... Um, 
you'll be able to kind of understand everything that he goes over. But this is really about uh, the situation of where he's at and the more general terroir of, uh, of Burgundy and the soil that we spoke of earlier. Et là, en quelque sorte, on voit une jeune vigne qui vient d'être plantée. Donc tu vois, tu as vraiment une belle vue. Et puis, tu as toute la géologie derrière, puisqu'on a en fait un peu taillé dans la roche pour faire le, le contour du, du dessus. D'accord. Et donc ça, c'est du calcaire Ouais. Là, c'est vraiment calca... argilo-calcaire et plutôt… Euh, donc, en fait, attends, je remets. Euh, en fait, tu as les… Les, le premier mètre en fait, où tu vois que tu as de la terre euh, arable euh, qui est plutôt argilo-calcaire et en dessous, euh, tu arrives tout de suite dans la roche en fait. qui est plutôt, plutôt une roche friable ouais. et donc, donc voilà. là, c'est vraiment ce qu'on voit c'est tout le, tout le, toute et la en fait, terre tout qui ça, est au-dessus ouais. Ouais. tout ça romain en fait, est fait sur ce modèle-là euh, avec des, des terrains euh, plutôt, euh, plutôt euh, très vite sur le caillou D'accord. Donc voilà. Ok. Et puis, ah bah, et puis comme ça, là, si je parle comme ça, on aura bien la vue derrière moi. Parfait. Et donc là, c'est le village de Saint-Romain en bas, là, c'est ça qu'on voit Non, Saint-Romain, c'est de... derrière moi, c'est de l'autre côté de la montagne. Et là, c'est juste l'entrée de Saint-Romain qu'on voit. En fait, on, a... on arrive à Saint-Romain par la vallée, là, et on voit quelques, quelques cuvries de viticulteurs en bas, mais... mais le village est plutôt derrière nous. Enfin, devant nous, devant moi, quoi. D'accord. Donc je regarde dans son sens. Ok. Donc voilà. Et donc là, derrière donc, toi, c'est Beaune. Et là, derrière moi, on a, euh, si on regarde la vallée au loin, on a bah, la Saroma, les dernières cuveries, Ossé du reste qui est tout de suite après, et puis Meursault et Beaune est plutôt euh, dans cette direction-là. D'accord. Voilà, mais c'est plutôt Meursault droit devant, là, dans la, dans la, combe, dans la combe. Donc voilà. Bon, bah, super. Et puis, et puis après, sur, la, sur les vins de Bourgogne, ben, en fait, je ne sais plus si j'ai expliqué la dernière fois que la plaque eurasienne avait choqué la plaque africaine et qu'on et qu avait eu, donc, la, avec l'effondrement du fossé bressant, l'apparition de tous les climats. Et c'est pour cette raison qu'on a des vins très différents à très peu d'écart. D'accord. Et donc. Euh... Tu avais, avais expliqué ça ou pas euh, Non, tu ne l'avais pas expliqué. Bon, et ben, en fait, quand, les, quand la plaque africaine a choqué la plaque eurasienne, on a eu l'émergence des Alpes. Et quand ouais. les Alpes euh, ont, ont émergé, quand on fait un tas de terre quelque part, il bah, faut prendre la terre ailleurs. C'est chez nous que ça s'est passé. Donc, ça s'est effondré. On a eu un affaissement. Et, euh, et quand ça s'est affaissé, en fait, c'est pour ça qu'on a des... C'est plutôt assez vallonné chez nous. Alors qu'avant, c'était un grand plateau. Et, euh, et en fait, quand ça s'est affaissé, les, 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 sols, les, les couches bien rangées se sont retrouvées... Euh, se retrouvaient complètement euh, différentes euh, alors qu'avant c'était un millefeuille bien, bien rangé partout pareil et là on a des sols très différents du coup à très peu d'écart d'accord et donc il y a des fissures voilà. euh, etc où, où les, voilà, où donc, ça... du, du, du coup là il y a des failles et tu vois le, en fait quand on regarde le, le terrain c'est plutôt, plutôt vallonné c'est jamais partout pareil et, euh, et du coup d'un lieu de à un autre on a des vins très différents Ok. So this was Lucien. Lucien Rocco, that uh, he's the 18th generation winemaker uh, with his family. Um, and he was, uh, he was showing, showing us his new vineyard, um, which was beside Saint Romain. And uh, obviously, I was interviewing him. Um, and just, I just realized I never got to tell you what La Cave was. So I'll just do a, I'll just tell you real quick. But we're a, we have two wine shops in France. And We are based here in Napa Valley in the U.S. And so we import boutique wines that aren't anywhere else in the U.S. And so Lucien, um, you know, we, we now import all of, all of his wines that aren't anywhere else in the U.S., which is, uh, which is a lot of fun to just, you know, allow people to discover all of those uh, small producers. So, um, and, uh, but yeah, what, uh, what do you think? So now we have the two Pinots, so poured side by side. And so, you know, tasting wine, especially with red, you typically just want to tilt them forward and use them almost as magnifying glass and just looking at, you know, the difference in color between the two. 
And those two are obviously very, uh, very similar. They are the same vintage, 2018. Uh, so for the red and burgundy, it's um, from uh, Haute Côte de Beaune, uh, and it's uh, also aged for 14 months, because you do yours for 14 months, right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other one uh, from Complan is, uh, uh, do you want to tell us about the uh, so Sobranes Vineyard? This is a vineyard in uh, Santa Lucia Highlands. And um, in my prior life, I was the director of winemaking for Silver Oak and uh, the sister winery Toomey. And at Toomey, beginning in 2007, we sourced uh, Pinot Noir from uh, all over California. We've been making a Russian River Pinot Noir from 2002. Um, and I first started working with Pinot Noir at Navarro Vineyards in 1978. And we expanded and we were up in the Anderson Valley, up in Mendocino, out on the Sonoma Coast, down at a very famous vineyard called Genesito in the San Maria area, just north of Sabra. But the vineyard area that I found most interesting was the Santa Lucia Highlands, which is the western edge of the Salinas Valley, the famous Salinas Valley of John Steinbeck in East of Eden. And this is an area that was developed by Italian Swiss farmers. And this is two um, very well-known families, the Francionis and the Pes, who planted probably the most famous vineyard in the Santa Lucia Highland called Gary's, Gary Francioni and Gary, Gary Pisoni. And Gary's son, Mark, as it turns out, uh, was on the wrestling team with the director of uh, a vineyard acquisition for Silver Oak. And he introduced me, old high school buddies. And so uh, my son and I were able to get a small section of this vineyard. And what I love about this is it has the cool, uh, cool influence of Monterey coming in, the, the sea uh, winds and the fog coming in from Monterey, but it's very dry and windy because the wind blows probably 320 days a year there. And that gives us this unique uh, combination of uh, dry and cool. And that's not something you see pretty yeah. much in any vineyard area I know of. You have wet and cool, and you have dry and hot, but to have dry and cool together gives a unique character and it gives us this concentration, the color that is very close to what we're seeing in Burgundy, which is a, a real triumph for California Pinot Noir. Yep. Um, and more of an earthy, that you have that Pinot Noir funk. Again, both of these wines are, uh, a, are fermented on in, with indigenous yeast and malolactic, and both are bottled unfiltered. I say both the, the Chardonnay and the, and the Pinot Noir from Complain. And um, I'm very happy with the way it's showing. Um, of course, the Burgundy is more classic. Yeah. It also seems younger because I think it, it has a longer life ahead of it. Yeah. And it, it, an 18 uh, red Burgundy is very youthful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. It's we literally uh, received it. It was bottled in the spring, uh, March, and um, you know, aged for about uh, 14 months. So it spent some time and uh, bottled in March. And then um, we uh, brew, brewed it over, labeled it, brewed it over, and arrived about a couple of months ago. So this is really just uh, freshly, freshly released. Um, we he likes to hold on to it for about a, a year before we release right. it, and uh, and yeah, so it's really just almost fresh out of the gates. And this one you can absolutely age it for the next twenty years, twenty five years if you wanted to, and yeah. there would be just absolutely no issue with that. Uh, if anything, you can probably just feel the acidity that's in the wine. Uh, that's going to take in a little bit of tannins you get kind of a good tannin structure on it actually and so yeah. and that will just take the wine and you'll just see all the flavors open up as the wine ages um and actually that brings me to talking maybe about our little offer that we have so 25 percent discount so what i'd recommend is just to get six bottles or more and so that way maybe for the next six years or maybe <laughs> you know a few exactly. years so you can open a bottle a year and see how the wine ages 
Um, but if you have that discipline, wait have, that long. <laughs> if you have that discipline. Uh, but yeah, we're doing 25% discounts on um, on six bottles or more. And then at 12 bottles, we uh, do a personal uh, tasting with, uh, with the person that got the wine. Um, so for Daniel and myself. Um, and um, the promo code is Frenchly. So just type in Frenchly at checkout and that will give you the, the discount. Yeah, on both of our web. And your website is La Cave. Lacavewines.com uh, and then uh, Complainwine.com. Complain wine. So he has more wine than I do, so he has <laughs> plural. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things gorgeous. I love about this Burgundy, Frederic, and it, it also speaks to how it's going to age. Yeah. And it's one of the great things that uh, I think it's one of the great quests for a winemaker and one of the great mysteries is why is a consumer at table, let's say, compelled to reach for the glass again mm -hmm. and keep tasting. And we've all had wines that are, when we do them in a blind tasting, they're very impressive. They're big, they're bold. Mm -hmm. They've, you know, gobs of jammy fruit, as yeah. our friend Robert Parker would say. <laughs> but you find you're not drawn back to the glass. Right. And one of the things that I think one of my theories is that a wine that offers you something different every time you smell and taste it is so draws you back because mm -hmm. you're curious where is it going to go now and this wine every time i smell it it's different it's you got know, different layers that are coming out at first it's a kind of toasted bread yeah. and then there is like preserved raspberries and then there's a little edge of funkiness to it and yeah. but it just keeps keeps it's, changing it's so funny you say that because i haven't told you but lucien really just tells me all the time that he makes the wine so you can enjoy a bottle and open another and that's truly how he like his approach is you know you don't want to make big and bold wines you certainly can but it's about enjoying good wine, good friends, having a good time in life. And, you know, truly kind of that French, you know, lifestyle of just, you know, going back to the wines and just enjoying, yeah. enjoying a, a good time with some friends. So, and this is 13.5 alcohol and the Complain is 13.2. Yeah. So, um, you know, you wouldn't think it would make that much of a difference to go to 14.2, but it really does. And the heat and the, 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 the viscosity of the alcohol changes the experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Complain is changing too. And it it's, is, yeah. yeah definitely opening, opening up. up. And to me, you get a little bit more of that softer side. You definitely get the bright acidity, right, just like right. the burgundy and everything. Maybe just a little bit softer side. Uh, that's most likely from that California sunshine that we we're talking it's about. It's plusher on the palate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's more uh, driven by berry fruit. Mm -hmm. And I think probably doesn't have the layering that the um that the burgundy does yeah um but that's i think it's a very nice new world uh yeah you know absolutely and it's just again it's just you know just thinking of it now it's like you can just feel the kind of saliva come back in and you know yes. you have the that's because of the acidity and your balance out your your palate and um it's uh no it's i absolutely love it i had it before and this is just absolutely incredible so uh, i'm looking forward to aging that one as well yes it's, yeah uh, it's i haven't had the discipline we we keep, <laughs> we keep drinking it talking about aging we we have a question from alex who's watching us on youtube and he asked how long can i keep a bottle of wine for that's mm. a vast question um so a bottle of wine um you know it really really depends on the wine. Some wines are made to be enjoyed right away. Uh, and uh, just to be honest, it's going to be all the bottles that are probably below $30 that you'll find in stores uh, most of the time. Um, and then, um, you know, over that, uh, you can have, uh, you can have obviously these wines that are made to have fun with right now, but you can get so much out of it down the road. A good rule to keep in mind is if you um, if you like a wine today, drinking it, tasting the wine, I would not age it more than about five years. Not that you won't like it afterwards. It's just that the wine would have changed so much that you might not like it as much. 
So that's just a, a quick little rule that I like to just put out there. So you don't wait on the wine thinking it's going to be this wonderful wine and then you just find something completely different than what you had. Um, so that's kind of my take, but no, but most of the great wines you can keep for 25, 30 years. And, you know, most of the Cabernets, uh, some of the best Cabernets, especially in Bordeaux and, you know, uh, a lot in Napa as well, are made to age 20 plus years. Uh, and I had, I was lucky enough to have one that was 30 years old from Napa. It was actually Shadow uh, uh, Montalina. Mm -hmm. And it was in the, it was in 80, uh, 86, I think it was. And, uh, Is that already 30 years ago? <laughs> flies by. But it still had fruit to it. And it still had yeah. that fresh fruit aspect. And yeah. it's just, it just shows that wine that is really well made uh, really sustains in time. And uh, uh, But there's yeah. another point that we must, <laughs> a caveat that I will yeah, toss in. Please. Um, and it's, it's the temperature you're storing at. So yes. you've probably all heard that wine is about time and place, uh, but once the wine is bottled, it's about temperature and oxygen more than time and place. So uh, two points, uh, if, you, if you can uh, get a storage area, uh, create a storage area, get a, get, a, get a Euro cave if you don't have a storage area, but you want to store your reds at 50, 50 to 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you want to store uh, my wine cave. I have the, the whites at 45. Uh, but the cooler you can store them in a steady temperature, you don't want the temperature varying a lot. Um, you're going to preserve the fruit and the tannins will evolve. The second point is about the relationship with oxygen. And if you noticed, uh, Frederick and I were talking about how these wines responded to oxygen. So everyone has a different taste of when a wine is ready to drink. Mm -hmm. And production winemakers are the last people you should ask because we're used to drinking very tannic wines because we have to evaluate wines when they're young. So only you know when a wine is right for you. But a really great way to do that is what the French call the prise de l'air. And if you have a wine that you haven't finished for dinner, leave it in the bottle and I can taste it the next day. And if it has gotten better, then that tells you that wine is going to improve with aging. Mm -hmm. If it's fallen apart, that's gonna tell you, well, you know what? I better drink that now. And if it's, you know, so you can judge how a wine is going to respond to the slow association with the air that happens in aging, which is really what it's about, or um, at correct temperature. Of course, if you have screw caps and, you know, uh, artificial corks, uh, it changes the whole formula because now you're really not getting air exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at the at the hour mark. Uh, I still have we still have a couple of videos, and we are still happy to take questions. I just wanted to share with you the little QR codes that we're talking about, in case you did want to kind of look at uh, visit the websites. Uh, we will still look at the two videos that are coming up. Um, but I just wanted to put those out there. So, Complan wines, just scan this uh, QR code and then uh, use the promo code Frenchly. And then for the Lucien uh, Rocco wines, uh, there's a specific uh, page on Lucien's, uh, on, on the Lacave website, just for Lucien, that you'll see a little bit about uh, the vineyard, the, the story, and then, um, you know, uh, all the different wines that you can get from him. And so again, Frenchly, you get 25% discount on the wines uh, if you order six or more. And if you order 12 or more, then you get obviously a personal tasting with either Daniel or myself, or if you get a case at each, uh, you'll get a, two of them. <laughs> and the personal tasting can be in person if you want to come or online. Or online. And uh, with the Complain, your code works for all of the wines, all of the current releases on the website. So that would include uh, the 2018 Rosé and the 2018 uh, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. All right, well, we'll stop sharing right now. Um, 
I was just going to ask Jeanne if there are any last questions, and then we'll just go ahead and play the videos, and that will be uh, that will be our exit for the for today. All right. Yeah, we can take a few more questions. If uh, Fran, Heidi, Alice, if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand right now, and we'll answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to let you go ahead, Frederick, and play the rest of the videos. Perfect. Well, I hope that everybody is enjoying some wine, if not this one, um, <laughs> today. It's uh, it's a lovely Friday, just leading up to the holidays. Exactly. And so anything that we can do, um, it's uh, yeah. I'm I'm super impressed with the with the comparison of the two wines. So and it's not um, too late. I think if you order soon, we can get you wines for your Thanksgiving dinner. Yes. And nothing goes better with Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, than Pinot Noir. Exactly. And it's yeah. not too much alcohol, so I can technically drink during the day and not feel bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With your pumpkin pie, you're on your own. And you have some dessert wine you could <laughs> recommend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, it's not a Macy's Macy's Day Parade. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's play the videos uh, and uh, and we'll take it from there. All right. Well, thank you all for joining. Thank and, you all for being here. Um, here are, uh, here's a video of Daniel and I out in the vineyard. So uh, you guys enjoy and uh, hopefully we can join us on maybe a next webinar. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you to you both. Here in the Linda Vista Vineyard in northwestern, northwestern part of the city of Napa. Yeah. Um, and this is a vineyard uh, a certified organic vineyard since yeah. 2001, farmed by Steve Mathiason. Mm -hmm. And this is where Sam and I source our fruit for, our, for the Complain Chardonnay and have okay. since 2017. Okay. Um, Wonderful. Which yeah. 2017 was your very first, first vintage, vintage yes. for Complain altogether? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And Steve makes five pickings here. Um, he starts at about 20 bricks, which is about 11% potential alcohol, and goes to about 24, 25 bricks, which is up in the 14. Okay. And then he blends the, the five together in different proportions to make uh, this Chardonnay. Okay. Sam and I get from the second picking, which gives us a wine between 11.5 and 12.5% and alcohol. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and you have just enough kind of flavor, development, and everything. Exactly. And and I picked on the basis, and Sam, this is really, Sam is the lead. Uh, we pick on the basis of flavor. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, there's even some grapes uh, around here. If you have a few just right here. Ah, there we go. <laughs> the little tiny ones. Look at those. Late harvest, <laughs> late harvest Chardonnay. Yeah. Here, uh, I'll share half the harvest I'll with you. One. Thank All you right. so good. much. All right, good, good. Very we, we are very collaborative. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. And so, you know, yeah. my method of tasting grapes is to is to squeeze between uh, my tongue and the roof of my mouth. And then we taste the pulp, mm -hmm. which is the first level of ripeness, the sugar and acid ratio. Mm -hmm. And then we chew on the skin, even in the whites. Mm -hmm. And spit. You learn to not swallow when you're tasting grapes right. all day. Yes, especially yeah. when they're underripe. Yes, because <laughs> you get what high acidity and uh, you yes bitterness. indigestion and other <laughs> gastronomic <laughs> problems. Yeah, right. um, so, what that allows us to assess is the how the skins are breaking down. Mm -hmm. um, even in the whites, the flavor and you know we. Just do have some some tannins and and some bitterness that comes from that layer of cells just below the skins. Mm. We're not so concerned with color, of course, right. but it does give us an indication of, of the how the pulp is breaking down, the pectins, and how the cell walls are breaking down in the skins, which tells us how the fruit is getting ripe. But with whites, it's mostly flavor. Right. And the last thing is the ripeness of the seeds. If the seeds are brown, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. but it's the last thing to happen in a warm climate like California, we wait for the seeds to get ripe. Sometimes we wait until December. Right. So if we can have that, that's great, especially in the reds, mm -hmm. because it, with the red where we're fermenting with the whole grape, yep. 
the seed tannins contribute uh, a lot of bitterness, especially if the seeds are green. Right. So the riper the seeds, the less of the rough seed tannins we get. Right. And Not so, so much a concern with the whites. Right. And with the Chardonnay, do you do any kind of cold soak before uh, you put it in, or is it just... No, so and I, you know, right. we should explain, because we forget that we're familiar with this. With, with, with white grapes, we typically, in this day and age, it wasn't that way when I started 50 years ago, right. but we go directly to the press with whole clusters. Yeah. So we press, we have very little skin contact, mm -hmm. only the skin contact that occurs in the press. Right. And um, and then we, we really just ferment the juice. Right. So the skins and the seeds are, are not factors. Really. Right. And so just to explain that press process, so it's basically it's called a bladder press. So it's like a big cylinder, we put all the four you know, grape clusters in right. together. And then there's an empty bladder inside that goes, uh, that blows up. That blows up, basically. Right. And so basically, what we have is the juice comes out of that press, leaving behind all the skins, all the, skins. All the, um, the uh, stems, and you know right. anything that would have come with the harvest right. and leaves and other things. In the old so, days, we destem the whites too, and right. and then destemmed into the press, and drain them, and then press them. Yeah. But now we found that the whole cluster pressing uh, is gives us a better result, gives us a finer right. juice. Let's see With the reds, we we crush. Sometimes we don't even crush. We just destem, which right. breaks the berries. Uh, we ferment then with the skins, with the seeds. Um, we we eliminate the stems, except with Pinot Noir, where we choose a percentage of stems, a percentage of whole clusters to put in. Right. Uh, it adds some complexity because we don't run those through the crusher. We just put the whole clusters in, and so we get a little uh, uh, carbonic maceration, yes. maceration carbonique, <laughs> which means the berries are individual fermentations inside the berries. Right. So there's no oxygen contact, and so you maintain that fruitiness. The fruitiness of, of, of Beaujolais Nouveau. Exactly. But you have that slight <laughs> element, um, you know, because Beaujolais Nouveau, we have that amylet character, that kind of banana character. Yeah. Um, we don't want that to be overwhelming. We just want that to be a complexing yeah. element with the Pinot, and you'll always see a winemaker when when we're digging out a tank of mm -hmm. Pinot Noir is always looking for the whole berries because they're delicious <laughs> and they're individual <laughs> fermentations and you pop them in your mouth and they burst with this, this <laughs> burst of, of half fermented juice. Right. The other thing we'll see because of the whole berries is we'll, the wine will be dry in the fermenter and then after pressing, we'll have a little bit of sugar and it will then finish the fermentation because right. there's some of the berries that haven't finished right. fermentation. Those are the ones we're looking for exactly. to, to, to <laughs> pop in our mouths. And just for everybody to know, whenever we kind of, you know, we call it digging out a tank, uh, yeah. you know, it's the tank is full of juice and then you have the cap with the, um, you know, on top with all the, all the skins. And so we first take out all the free run juice that's below all the skins. the skins that are left behind in that tank and so we need to physically to most of the time to physically go into the tank use the shovel take all of that out all right thank you so much for that last video um we're gonna wrap it up you guys are still muted if you want to mute and oh. maybe say a few last words before we say bye to everyone yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to really thank everybody that uh, that tuned in with us today and, uh, you know, uh, listen to the wines. If you have any other questions beyond this day or just want to find out a little bit more about each of the different, uh, you know, uh, wines and wineries and want to come and visit us, uh, just get in touch, you know, just send yes. us a message and we're always happy to, uh, you know, we're we're quite small so you know i import small producers uh sell small producers uh and danielle obviously uh is a uh, you know they they make like how many cases do you make 500 cases 500 cases of wine and then that's it so you know we are always happy to connect with you and um please uh please do so either next time you're in napa or if 
we're preparing a, a special dinner and just want advice on what wines would be best, um, you know, for you. So, yeah, with that being said, um, any last words, Daniel? Or? Well, yes, please, uh, as Frederick said, uh, complain, C-O-M-P-L-A-N-T, wine.com. And there's an info at Complain Wine. Uh, I'll get that email. Uh, if you have any questions or if you are coming to visit, we'd love to see you. And um, but please don't 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 send me any requests for abalone. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're now uh, uh, interdit. We can't go get abalone. So I can provide you with wine, maybe some good wild mushroom recommendations, but but no, no abalone, not, not for a couple more years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to you both. And thank you to everyone who watched until the end. Uh, we uh, appreciate it. Fran, did you want to say something? Oh, I just want to say merci beaucoup. C'est très gentil de, de vous voir. Et uh, comme je bois pas le vin, mais c'est très intéressant quand même. Thank you for your feedback. Merci. Merci. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great rest of your day, wherever you are in the world, and we'll